You are watching Finding Our Talk. Vous regardez parler pour survivre. Pour qu'on te nique qu'à la peau. Tu te vois, mais on te voit. Lègue, c'est une espèce de l'espoir. Hello, and welcome to Finding Our Talk. I'm Paul Chaput, and I'm your host for this series, which looks at Aboriginal languages in Canada. Today we're traveling far and wide to look at the historical development and modern applications of syllabic writing systems. A group of Cree teachers from James Bay will show us how syllabics are used to promote literacy in their communities. And Josie Kusigak and Robbie Watt will guide us through the debate surrounding standardization of Inuktitut syllabics. But first, we'll take a look at some of the earliest forms of First Nations writing. The language existed thousands of years without a writing system and how the language or the history was able to be kept as a record was through music and storytelling uh, from generation to generation. People did have uh, what we call the Kaliu uh, Yakpai. Uh, which is apparently the markings on the stone. Some people use uh, pictorial kind of uh, uh, writing, but most everything was done orally. And if you don't know any of the, uh, the writing systems of the world, uh, it is compensated by able to read the land, the Inuksuk, the sky, the, you know, clouds. A wide range of symbolic, ideographic, and pictographic systems of drawing and writing existed among the First Nations of North America, which predate or overlap with the introduction of Western forms of writing. They were inscribed on the human body on stone, bone, bark, wood, fabrics, skins, or metals, and they used a wide range of tools in writing substances. These and other writing systems complemented oral forms of storytelling and memorizing for the thousands of years First Nations peoples have inhabited North America. Wampum belts of the Iroquois nations are among the earliest records of internation treaties and diplomacy. The Ojibwe used birch bark to record songs and migrations and to pass on sacred teachings. Pictographs were also part of sacred rituals, spiritual journeys, and learning. Other forms of picture writing had other uses. To document important political events, to record the passage of time, to send notices to other tribal groups and nations, whether of peace and friendship or war. Others were used to create maps or to keep accounts. The Red Record tells the epic story of the arrival of Aboriginal people to North America and describes the deeds of a hundred generations of clans and chiefs. 
gradually pictorial representations evolved towards more symbolic forms of writing Mi'kmaq hieroglyphics are one of the earliest known forms of non-pictorial writing among North American native people. European influence reshaped traditional spirituality. The newcomers also brought a highly systematized and abstract form of writing. It was only in, in the mid um, or later 1800s that the uh, the Anglican Church decided, well, you know, if we're going to teach Indians and Inuit uh, Christianity, well, they better be able to read the Bible somewhere along the line and uh, sing the hymns and so on. So they introduced a syllabic system, which is apparently an old uh, Pittman type of uh, shorthand in some ways. James Evans, a missionary in Ontario, developed a system for writing the Ojibwe language that he called syllabics. Evans later successfully adapted his syllabic system to the Cree language. Simple and easy to learn, it was quickly mastered by the Cree. Its use spread rapidly as far as the Rocky Mountains, through messages drawn with charred sticks on birch bark sheets. Evans became known as the man who made birch bark talk. The communication must have been a pretty incredible thing to discover that you can actually write mother with a bullet lead tip point onto a matchbox or something rather and say, I am fine, sign so and so, give it to a person and at the other end, wherever they're going, your mother's going to receive this. And that kind of communication is incredible. You didn't have to be a shaman to do this. Anybody would be able to designate certain sil syllables, letters of their language onto a piece of paper or whatever was able to communicate. That's one of the uh, good things about the church is that it allowed us to, to protect, to preserve our language. It was important for them to be able to communicate with us but now this writing system that we have allows us to communicate with one another now without having to talk orally. Syllabics were primarily used to promote Christianity. The Roman alphabet was a kind of secret code. It was used for legal and political documents, often to the disadvantage of native people still unfamiliar with it. Angry at being duped into signing treaties they did not understand, or frustrated with the inadequacies of borrowed writing systems, some resourceful individuals developed their own writing systems and alphabets. Among the best known of these was the Cherokee alphabet, created in 1831. This system was widely adopted used to translate legal documents and in the publication of the first Native American newspaper, the Cherokee Phoenix. In the 20th century, the federal government took over First Nations education. Residential schools systematically erased first languages and writing systems. But now First Nations are taking control of their own education. They are implementing language programs and syllabics are developing to meet modern day needs. For more than a decade, this dedicated group of educators from the Cree communities in northern Quebec have been meeting in workshops. They develop curriculum and teaching materials 
using modern Cree syllabics. <laughs> They are inspired by Annie Whiskey Chan, who in 1973 helped found the Cree Way program for native education. Syllabics were embraced, and since then their use has steadily evolved. The first teachers in the program often had to learn syllabics themselves. The main written materials available in the Cree language were hymn books. Since we started using our language in the school, uh, uh, we have been producing material to be used by the children and the teachers. At the beginning, uh, there was uh, it was very difficult because most of the time we were translating from English uh, to Cree, and the pictures were not did not de depict the Cree culture. We use our, our own Cree people to do the illustrations. So it, it's, it shows the language and the culture, and with that, the values of the people and what we want to keep uh, in using our language in the schools and uh, teaching our children. They see syllabics uh, in the, around the community, and they know that's that's their language. And now, uh, when they now we have a head start, they start using that when they're like very very young. Much has changed since the early days of the Creeway program, when materials were written and produced in a single northern community. Despite radical changes in the production process, a strong connection remains with the ideals of those early years. We're sticking to syllabics. We did try using the Roman orthography and writing the, the, the language, but the words were like... <laughs> that long. <laughs> These were at a workshop that we had in 1990 or 1991. What we do is we've given Anna Johnny Shikapio's stories because he's inland dialect. And what will happen now is Anna will proofread it, then it will go to Daisy and Ruth to do the southern standardization, then it will go to Linda and Lucy to provide us with the northern dialect. From there, we go through this whole process of putting it together into a book. Materials are still produced in three different dialects, using the stories and resources from within the communities themselves. The Cree of James Bay all speak a similar dialect, so it was easy to introduce a common writing system. The history of syllabics was more difficult in the vast Arctic expanses, where dialects are very different. Their syllabics also took root more than a century ago. bits when we were quite young. We used to hear it a lot on the radio once it was really popular. We learn it in kindergarten. It's fairly easy to learn because it's like phonics and um, we learn it in a song so then we always remember that. We adapted our alphabets to throat singing once we learned how to throat sing so we sort of decided to see you know how can we make this even more funky. <laughs> So 
Arabic is just uh, quite important in our language because it symbolizes our the sounds that we the sounds that we use to speak in our language. Uh, we didn't used to have syllabics or alphabets in our language, but now we can see them visually, and it can help us to learn our way of pronunciations. For me, the thing that's important is that um, if you try and write Enoch did with, um, with just uh, English alphabet, it's easy to bastardize what it is that you're trying to read because, you know, if you read with the English alphabet, you can say, well, my name is Takralik instead of Takralik. If you look at the syllabics, you, there's only one pronunciation that goes with that. So it makes more sense to have something that is completely suited to it, regardless of where it came from. Reverend James Peck arrived in northern Quebec in 1876. He was the first missionary to be permanently posted among the Inuit. He worked on adapting presyllabics to better represent the sounds of Inuktitut. When they introduced it to the Inuit with the same uh, syllabic or the alphabet, uh, there were quite a few uh, sounds that were missing that were not represented by the syllabics. Peck's mission included translating biblical material into Inuktitut syllabics. He promoted its use and taught reading and writing to the Inuit. Peck steeped himself in the language. He studied six hours a day for seven years. For this, he earned the Inuktitut name by which he is still remembered, Ukamak, the one who speaks well. Syllabics spread rapidly across the Eastern Arctic through the influence of traveling preachers letter writing was also popular. In the first part of the 20th century, syllabics were routinely taught in many schools in the north. But early missionary influence on the development of syllabics created some confusion. There was an Anglican syllabic form, and there was a, a Roman Catholic uh, syllabic form. And uh, if you wrote Jesus in the Anglican form, the Roman Catholic form was blasphemous, you know, so, uh, and vice versa. And um, it was very hard. Uh, you act, we actually had to get the, uh, the two churches to release their flock, so to speak, in order to develop a writing system that reflected the sounds of the language. In 1974, Josie Kusigak was appointed executive director of the Inuit Language Commission, created to study the state of written Inuktitut and recommend changes for the future. In order to uh, make enough room to put the new symbols that the Roman Catholics or the Anglicans never had in Inuktitut, like Ningunga, which is a uh, a real uh, Inuit, Inuit sound, none of those were represented uh, originally. So in order to make room for those, uh, we had to kind of take out the, uh, the original A P T K, or which was now recognized as I Pai Tai Kai. People really assume that they've always had this writing system and some people assume that it was God-given. And uh, to take it away and to change it, uh, to tweak it, to try and make it to represent Inuit language is blasphemous to, to many people. And, uh, but if you do care about the sustenance, enhancement of uh, Inuit language, uh, you have to make the tough decision uh, to make it available and teachable to any young Inuk or Kabrunak or whoever uh, wants to be able to read and write uh, uh, Inuktitut. Many different dialects of Inuktitut are spoken throughout the Arctic regions of Canada. In addition to Greenlandic, Alaskan, and Siberian Inuktitut. Efforts to create a standardized syllabic system meant the exclusion of some of the sounds unique to certain dialects. Nunavik is the name given to the Inuit lands covering the northern part of Quebec. 
Robbie Watt is president of the Avitak Cultural Institute, whose mandate is to preserve and promote culture in Nunavik. Avitak is one of the many institutions created to promote fluency in Inuktitut and in the use of syllabics. Inuktitut was an oral tradition passed on from generation to generation. For me, syllabics is a contemporary component in a sense because it has allowed us to preserve a lot of our language and also it has opened doors to start looking at um, coming up with more uh, Inuktitut equivalencies to new technologies that are coming today. So it kind of was the, the, the pioneer of what was to come and which is what we're facing today. My name is Daisy. I'm originally from Kujuak, northern Quebec. I was born and raised there. And it's not long ago I got this position at Avatak uh, which is a um, language program. We have a terminology database which all the interpreters and translators, they get together maybe once a year or two times a year. What they do is um, either bring back the old words that we were losing or um, if they had a new word list coming from a medical term or or just as whatever it may be, if they have a new list, they bring it to the conference or to the workshop, and they share it together amongst the other interpreters and translators. Verification has to be done with the same word to make sure that every one of them have a same understanding. Technological and regional differences are shaping the future of syllabics. In the new territory of Nunavut, creation of a standardized writing system for all Inuktitut speaking regions is seen as a sign of progress. It's a necessary leap into the future through the window of technology. Standardization is seen in a different light in Nunavik, where preserving dialects is more important than creating a single standard. The more unique we are in this world, I think the longer the human race is going to survive. We add to the uniqueness of the world. Uh, the world does not have one language. Vast expanses, different histories and dialects have made the goal of standardization difficult. But the energetic debate animates this search, the surest sign of the strength of Inuktitut. Next week, we're going to visit a West Coast community that has developed its own writing system. We'll learn the story of Dave Elliott, a Sanish fisherman who helped preserve his language, Senshafan, one of the coastal Salish languages. We'd like to hear your comments about our program and any suggestions for future episodes. Just drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching, and see you next time on Finding Our Talk.